Hello and welcome to the Queer Thesperience. I am your host, Casper Oliver. I use he, him, and they, them pronouns. And today I am joined by the amazing and wonderful Kevin Free. Uh, if you could please enjoy your uh, introduce yourself to whoever may be listening. Yeah, sure. Hi, I am Kevin R. Free. Oh, of course, I am. I'm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I use he, him pronouns and um i i do you want me to just say things about who i am and what it, I do? It, sure. tell us about yourself yes oh sure um you said you only wanted 45 minutes so this is the short version um, <laughs> uh, i am let's see i am a black um maker of theatrical things so that means web series and podcasts and theater mostly. And uh, I have been an audiobook narrator for, oh my gosh, nigh on 20 years. I have narrated mm -hmm. about 400 titles um, wow. or been a part of at least 400 titles. And um, I really love my three cats. And I really love to cook. Ah, I didn't know that you had uh, done that many audiobooks. I mean, you have an amazing voice for it, so I'm not surprised. Uh, but... <laughs> yeah, I started in 2001. Dang. Shortly after September 11th, I got my first book. Wow. Yeah. Now, what, 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 so what have been some of your favorite books, if you have any? Oh, boy. Um, I will say that since the pandemic started to rage um i have done really great books hmm. um and i don't want to talk any crap about any books that i've done in the past uh, but i do want to say that there are a lot of books that uh, to which i haven't connected and also recorded yeah so sticking to all of the books that are my favorites since the beginning of the year um, I did the very first novel of the Murderbot Diaries. I don't know if hmm. you know about the mm -mm. sci-fi Murderbot. There was a series of novellas that I did written by Martha Wells. Um, and the first novel was called Network Effect. And that was the first book I did. I did it in March, the week before New York City shut down. Wow. So it was the last book that I recorded in a studio this year. I'm talking to you from my studio in my pantry. Yeah. In my, in my apartment in New York City. <laughs> and so um, so Network Effect by Martha Wells is a really wonderful book. I just finished the final book of stories um, in Jay Bell's uh, very long series, the Something Like series. Mm -hmm. um, and this is Something Like Stories 3. And he is a queer author, self-published author. Um, and he's wonderful. And his books are really, really sweet. Um, and, oh gosh, oh, I did Hank Green's, um, an absolutely remarkable thing, or was that the first one? A Beautifully Foolish Endeavor, that's what it's called. Ah. Please don't tell Mr. Green that I, I mean, that was the first, I listened to the first book so that I would be ready for the second book, which I'm on, ah. and, um, if the first one was called An Absolutely Remarkable Thing, and the second, the, the sequel is called a beautifully foolish endeavor and i'm on that and i loved that experience um i'm not sure i'm supposed to talk about books that i'm about to record but i'm about to record another book that i'm not going to talk about that is really a really great adventure and then another book that i'm going to start recording is about animation oh non-fiction and i just finished a book about muhammad ali it's called cassius x and it's about when Muhammad Ali was Cassius X. Huh, that's really cool. Yeah, so you've been kind of all over the place with the books that you narrate. It's been it's uh it's it's been really great to do all kinds of different kind. All, I mean, novels and young adult fiction and literary fiction and um, nonfiction, science fiction. It's it's really I'm really one of the lucky ones. And people always say, hey, I have this I have this great book. You should read this book. And I always say, I don't really read for pleasure anymore because <laughs> I get paid I for a living. Um, and I don't have time because every time I start to read something that's purely for me, somebody writes to me and asks me to do um, 
an audiobook, which is right. fine, which is great. Um, so I find that I only read articles about theater and recipes. Information you're going to use. <laughs> Information that I'm really going to use. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So you've been doing audiobooks for about 20 years. Um, but what other kind of when did you start acting? What was your foot in the door in the performance world? Um, is it, I was in high school. Uh, I'm 51. I just turned 51 and I graduated from high school in 1986. So my older brother um, was in a play and I just w was enamored of his talent. And so I wanted to be just like him. I'd always been a singer. Um, I trained as an opera singer all through junior high and high school. Huh. And around my sophomore year of high school, I thought, oh, maybe I don't want to really, maybe I don't, this is what I want to do. Or maybe I just want to do theater because my brother's doing it. It's really good. And he's, you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and so um, the very first play that I did in high school, I did plays before that, but I don't consider them my entree into the theater. Right. Um, but I did a, I did a production in my sophomore year of high school called The Night of January 16th, hmm. which was written by Ayn Rand. Um, it had, uh, we chose a jury from the audience in the play. You, tr you choose a jury from the audience, they come up on stage, and then you basically do the case. The whole the play is the case. And um, I think I played somebody named Elmer Sweeney in that. He was comic relief. At least I thought he was at the time. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, my brother had one of the leading roles. He was a lawyer. Um, and... Uh, that was when I knew that I wanted to keep doing it. And so I just kept, kept doing theater like that. Um, and then in all through college did theater without getting a degree in theater, I have a degree in political science. Um, but, um, so I, I always knew from the time that I was about 15, that I was going to be an actor. That's kind of, you've just kept on trucking on through and yeah. With the podcast being what it is with the queer experience, I also usually ask uh, when guests first knew about or first realized kind of their place within the queer community or started that journey. Because uh, I know some people are like, oh, I knew that I was bi from the age 10. And then some people are like, well, I thought I was this and then this and then this. And it turned yeah. out. So... Well, um, do, uh, well, first, I don't know where I am in the queer world. I'm, I call myself gay. Um, yeah. But I, in terms of, like, my standing and all that kind of stuff, like, I mean, we know I'm a bear. We know things like that. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I don't, I don't know in terms of um, where I am spiritually or in history, et cetera, et cetera. But I will tell you, be, because I just want to be, I just, I, I know you want me to place myself but I also want to make sure that in placing myself, um, I, I'm still figuring out where I stand about a lot of things because I, mm -hmm. even though I'm super gay, totally gay <laughs> I've been with my partner for 21 years, I'm super gay. Yeah. Um, I also am more black than I am gay. Ah, that's all and right. So the inter so not, w if there oh, are yeah. degrees, yeah. I always think of myself as a black man before I think of myself as a gay man. Right. And then I, even though I, it's really complicated. That's okay. But it's, but it's also not complicated. Yeah. So, so here's 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 my straight up answer to that question is that um, when like in 1974. Mm -hmm. I recall watching The Man from Atlantis, which starred Patrick Duffy, who was so hot. Um, <laughs> you're young, so maybe you remember Patrick Duffy from, he was the dad on Step by Step. Okay. With Suzanne, I think Suzanne Summers was his wife on that. That sounds about right, yeah. Anyway, Patrick Duffy was the man from Atlantis, and he was always swimming, like, with nothing on his body. <laughs> and I remember, at, I think I was five seeing him somebody caught him and he was tied to a chair shirtless struggling and i remember thinking that is really attractive to me now i'm not into bondage so much but i just <laughs> sort of like i was really into him and yeah. then um 
Um, and then I was in love with Bruce Willis in the 80s. That's fair. <laughs> when I was in high school. Um, and at the same time, Duran Duran had a video, um, uh, the, the Wild Boys video. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, what's his name was was uh, Simon Le Bon was strapped to a wind, a water mill. And he kept going underwater and coming back and throwing his hair. And he was wet and he, would t he was tied to a thing. And I thought, oh, my gosh, this is a theme. So, yeah, I've always known that I was... I was gay. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, and that's fantastic. I, I, that's one of the beautiful things about, you know, being queer is it's everyone's journeys are, it's so different. And so there are so many stories to tell, which is something that I find really beautiful about the whole thing. Um, so you've been doing audiobooks for 20 years. You've been in theater since you're about 15 and you said that you're still doing, um, audiobooks and other things like that. But you also told me about a show that you're doing called the the Reparations Show. Yes. Now I would love to hear about that. Yeah, sure. Um, I, you know, uh, after George Floyd was murdered, mm -hmm. um, I, the co-creator and I, his name is Erez Ziv. I've made a lot of stuff with him and for him um, at Frigid New York. I'm a curator of a festival called Queerly, and um, uh, and he wrote to me when the protests started to rage, mm -hmm. and he said, you know, there must be a way for us to have a show that features black and indigenous artists and to pay them a little money to be on the show. And I said, oh, you mean like a reparations show? And he said, what? yeah yeah okay and so um we created this show called the reparation show um and it is every friday night on the internet uh at frigid new york's facebook page but also we stream to vimeo and youtube but the show um features a different host every week hmm. um there is a segment to unify the show. There's a segment in the middle uh, called This Week in Reparations in which I talk to um, somebody who is a newsmaker to me or I, well, one time I presented, I have this this kooky web series that is really just my cat purring, one of my cats purring. And I, one time I was in, in such a, in, in a place of m despair or anger about the world. And I right. thought, you know what? I don't want to talk about Here's a list of things I don't want to talk about on this week in reparations, but what I want to do is share with you a thing that makes me happy, that gives me joy, that is repairing my spirit, and it is this web series of my cat. And so I, you know, I played all six of those 15 second episodes of my cat. Good. Uh, <laughs> right. Um, so the reparation show is really a space for Black and Indigenous artists to do a, a show that, to do whatever they want say what they want and say it for as long or as angry or as sad as they'd like and to bring on um their own guests that they that they'd like to bring on to talk about those things or to show their art to the world and um i the world of of my world of audiobooks has been so busy and it has felt so uh, i can hardly catch my breath sometimes because of yeah. the work that needs to get done and uh and uh, and all of that is fine it is busier now for me than it has ever been and i thought i knew i was busy before th before the shutdown, but now yeah. I had no idea. And so doing a thing like the Reparations Show, which is sort of par for the course for me in terms of creating a show and doing it for little to no money. Right. right? We pay all of our artists when they come on the show. It's not a lot, but it is a nominal fee. And yeah. I don't expect anybody to do the show more than once because of the pay, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, but d for me, doing the show every week and not being paid for it feels really good. Yeah. It feels as though um, 
this show in particular feels like I am paying reparations to my community and to myself by meeting all of these artists who are new to me and having them on the show. Um, it just sort of is a balm to my spirit. So um, thank you for asking about it. I'm, I really, I really love doing it. It's Friday nights. It's on Frigid New York's Facebook page. We also stream it to YouTube and to Vimeo. The ticket price is pay what you can. Mm -hmm. um, if you if you feel like paying what you can, uh, otherwise, you can hook it up. You can find it and hook it up, see it, whatever. Well, yeah. if you are listening to this episode on YouTube, I will put the link in the description below. And if you found this episode through Facebook or wherever, I will directly link to it so that you can catch it on Fridays. Yay, thank you. Of course. I mean, this part of why we're doing this is to spread the awareness, spread, you know, get that out there. Because I honestly, that is such a fantastic and beautiful idea. And I I love kind of the, the story behind the title because it's, you know, it's straight up what it is. And I think a lot of artists have been really inspired by kind of just how the world is going right now to put something out there to get voices out there, to get stories out there and to share their own stories. And I think it's it's fantastic seeing how many people are standing up and sharing their stories and are finally being heard. Yeah. Yeah. I love that too. Um, and I, you know, I, the thing that I learned about the sh uh, during the shutdown, at least for myself, was that the, the barriers to success quote success are really not real yeah the hierarchy it's interesting the way it keeps coming back to us i got an email today from somebody who i'd been involved with a project that uh, with which i'm not involved um anymore but one of the producers reached out to me to say that someone was interested in doing a reading of it and um was i interested in directing it and my answer was no, but, uh, and, and it was because there were some, there were some not, co not collaboration issues, but some story issues that I'd asked about and wanted to change. And we had discussed it and discussed it and it didn't matter, but th that's not the point. That's not the point of the story. The point of the story is the person who wants to produce a reading of it also wants to direct it. And in, in the email that they sent to the playwright they said uh i want i want to do this play and i want to do this play <laughs> as part of our reading series and here are links to some of our other series and also we we get you know very prominent broadway stars and xyz blah 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 yeah do in the play and when i read that i thought you know i I guess people are still using that as a selling point. Yeah. And that used to be the thing that made me really sad about my career. I mean, I have worked in every form of media you can name. I've worked in all of them. I've done something in every single one. But I have never been on Broadway. I made history as the first Black Bellamy in the Fantastics off-Broadway in New York. Uh, I've, uh, I've, uh, I've done all the things. But because, but because I had never been on Broadway, and when I was 15, I believed that Broadway was the thing that w was the pinnacle. Right. I always felt a little sad about my own career, which is pretty great. Yeah. I'm pretty happy and really, I feel really great and loved. And, you know, last year when I thought I was busy, I had no idea how busy, what busy actually meant. Right. right. And now, I, now that I'm busy and people are asking me to do things, it feels like, oh, this is, this is the kind of shine that I've been wanting for 20 years. So thank you for the shine. And also everybody can get this shine. Right. Really. It, and it, and it doesn't have to. You're not going to draw me with Broadway stars or this X, Y, Z, unless I actually admire them. Right. I'm not, and, and that is how the pandemic has changed my entire world. I'm not, I'm not impressed by people. And I've always said this, but of course I didn't believe it, but I'm not impressed by people who do the exact same 
thing that I do unless they're also consistently really good people to me. Right. Um, so I, I think, um, um, the barriers to success don't exist in the same way that we thought they did because we now live in a world where people can make things on their own and get noticed for it. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think the, the only, the big, the big difference is that there are a lot of people who have a lot of money backing up the things that they do. And I, we just have to work hard to get that money or we just make the thing anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm hoping that people are realizing that now that they can they can make their own stuff and put it out there in the world. And that's the way it is. Yeah. Like, I know one of the things and you said two points that really stuck with me and like really is the whole Broadway thing. Oh, my gosh. I, it's like I've wanted to act since I saw Cats on Broadway for the first time when I was a teeny tyke. And ever since people found out that I wanted to be an actor, they're like, oh, so you're going to go to New York. Like, why would I why would I go to New York? It's like, well, you want to be on Broadway. I'm like, I'm I'm not a singer. I, I, I'm not going to say I can't sing, but like, I don't really, that's not what I do. And it's always Broadway. Yeah. But the, the, the recording studio in my closet though. <laughs> like, <laughs> the only time I've ever in the closet nowadays is when I'm recording my really gay <laughs> podcasts. Like, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, it's kind of refreshing to hear that that happens to other people, but at the same time, it's like, but wh why? <laughs> why yeah. Broadway? <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, uh, another thing that I think about a lot is that if, um, when, if I know a person who could do a thing that I would like, that, that I have the power to give them to do the thing. Yeah. And I also respect their work. Why wouldn't I just give it to them? Yeah. And, and then I think, so I think about that all the time with, with the rich producer friends that I have, they, the ones who know that I'm making the reparation show, who then are not interested in giving any money to it mm. at all. And I think, you know, it's, it's, the, it's your right. You certainly don't have to give money to it. Um, and if you ask me where your money should go you must understand that I'm going to say it should go to the reparation show. Right. <laughs> um, right here. It's right here. So, I mean, I've asked people, I've asked about that. I mean, I've said that to people all the time. Like, I, I, I get it. I get that you want to know, like, and all of these organizations are worthy organizations. They're really great. And you've asked me to choose which of these you, you should give money to. And I'm just going to say, so that you're not confused at all, you should just give that money to my organization so that I can pay artists to do what they do. Right. Um, yeah. And it's... I, I'm just really thinking a lot about the hierarchy and why it exists and why, why, I mean, you know, the fact that you friended me on Facebook and I, I mean, I said yes. <laughs> and then you never reached out to ask me to this podcast for whatever reason it was shyness pure and utter <laughs> shyness of i it, it's mostly that i've admired your acting chops since before i owned a mic and it was one of those things where as a queer actor i've always admired those who are open and successful and it was, it's especially you and Dylan from Night Vale. I really just look at you too. And I'm like, wow, like goals, you know? And, oh, nice. and, uh, and yeah. And so I just, when you, when you messaged me on Twitter, I was like, and this, I could have just asked, you know, it, I, I learned a lesson, <laughs> just ask. It, the worst I, that it, can happen is say no. It really makes a lot of sense. And I also think, you know, my, um, I, I'm teaching a business of acting class um, hmm. at Hofstra University, and I I have a couple of students writing letters to people that they admire. Yeah. And I've had to send the letter. I mean, I'm, they're sending the letters. They send them to me first, and then I send them back, and I say, "Why don't you, why don't you think of yourself as an equal to that person? Right. Don't think, don't 
Don't stop apologizing for asking the questions. Stop. Don't do that. Tell them, tell them exactly what you're looking for. Like you don't want to be their friend necessarily. Like that might be nice that they became your friend, but what you want is professional advice. What you want is mentorship. So why wouldn't you just say, Hey, I'm in need of a mentor. I really admire your career and I want to do what you do. How did you get there? And that is not, that is not the same thing as saying, oh my gosh, I think you're so great. And I really am so sorry that I'm asking you this question, but I want to ask you this question. Can right. I, you know? Yeah. Um, and I, I think it all the time. I think about it all the time. There, I mean, there's a fine line between what's appropriate and what's, of course, inappropriate. Not a fine line. <laughs> it's, there's a there's uh, a line. <laughs> there's an actual line, and it's not fine. <laughs> it's but, pretty bold. But you know, but you know, if you if if an artist does the exact same exact same thing you do, and they do it for more money and more acclaim, then why not ask them how you got there? How right. did you do it? And would you be interested in advising me on some of my stuff? Yeah. Or what? You know, maybe they're too busy to do it. And it will not be the last time you get a no. Right. It is. And no just means no. It doesn't mean. It doesn't. It doesn't put you any lower than you already are in your own estimation if it puts you lower. Right. Right. Yeah. Does that make sense? No. Yeah, it does. Because yeah, okay. like I, it's one of those things that um when it's come to me like reaching out and asking people there have been multiple people i've reached out to just like hey i do this thing i have this podcast where i interview people let you come on you know have you come on and ask you questions you share your stories whatever and i've had multiple people just not reply and i'm like okay on to the next person you know That's and right. And it's, you know, and I don't know if they didn't reply because, I don't know, maybe they don't even run their own email. Maybe an agent runs their email. Maybe, you know, yeah. there's so many things. And it's the way to view it is like, this ain't the door for me. On to no. the next one. And, I'm, and maybe they are replying because they think, who do, the, who do you think you are writing to me to ask me for this? And maybe they think that. And th yeah. you know what? That's, there's nothing you can do about it. That's just what they think. It's funny. I was in that whole thing with my with the, the offer that I got today. I called my manager and and he was googling everybody involved. And I was like, um, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> We're just gonna say no. But I wanted you to know that I was saying no before I before I say no. So it's he was like, but how dare they? How dare they? Blah blah blah. And this guy says he knows these. And I was like, John, these are these are not. This is not real. Right. This whole, I can get all these Broadway people, blah, blah, blah. Well, who can't? And right now, who can't? We're all looking for work right now. So, yeah. like, <laughs> yeah. So it's not even, it's not even a thing. He thinks that it's something that's impressive and maybe it's impressive to the people who wrote the play and want to produce this thing. It's not important to you and me. We know that it's not important to you and me because we're going to say no to the job. Right. <laughs> I'm not, we're not interested. Yeah. And so, uh, um, but I think, you know, I, I'm hoping that I can hold on to my belief that the hierarchy isn't real, that it's in our minds when this is all over, if it, if it's all over. Um, and, um, that I will still be able to listen to people who are just starting out people who are just starting out with really great opinions and really great um a great sense of of what what is sound creatively right that i can listen to them and learn from them i'm hoping that i hold on to this new this new world where we are all on a level playing field even though you know we're not all well, on yeah. the same level, but in my world, right, I'm just not participating in that other stuff anymore. Yeah, and I think that that's so important because I I literally did an interview maybe two hours ago where we were talking about casting and diversity and um, primarily because my opinion my ex experience comes from trans stuff and all that, and a common thing that came up was playing it safe with big names and not letting new fresh talent in and for the sake of proper representation. And 
one thing that kind of is carried from that to this is it all depends on the talent and the authenticity of the person and these big names, whether at Broadway or Hollywood, you know, it's, yeah, yeah. it's how much does it really matter when you're trying to just tell a good story and right. give a good experience, give a good show, wh whether that good is for laughs or for educational purposes or to make someone scared or cry, you know, whatever that is, yeah. as long as that person can achieve the goal. Totally. So, but I, I, I really am so glad that you could uh, come on and share about the reparations show. I know I'm super excited to check it out now. <laughs> like this oh, seems, good. this seems, it sounds beautiful. And again, I'll share the link so that those who listen can find it through here. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to like to plug while I have you here? Oh gosh. Um... Well, let's see. Uh, I used to be a New York neo-futurist, um, which is how I met um, Jeffrey Craner. Uh, we have written plays together. Jeffrey Craner, who's one of the creators of Welcome to Night Vale. It's also how I know Meg Bashwinner and uh, Joseph Fink. Um, anyway, the New York neo-futurists, um, they are a wildly prolific theater company and just like all the other theater companies have been struggling since the shutdowns began, but they are still working and have paid their ensemble members since March, even without a show to do. And so I want to plug their podcast, which is called Hit Play, and I want to encourage everybody to join their Patreon um and also to donate to them whatever amount they can afford so that they can continue to give a little bit of money to their ensemble who can't work because the theaters are all closed all right i will also put a link to all that um i know i've seen you you see a lot of um kind of charities and donations going around for that and i think it's really good that especially right now the actors who are making money either through side gigs or you know nine to five jobs can help those who like really can't like i know band camp is doing those band camp fridays where all money goes straight to the artist Oh, that's great. I think yeah. That, that's great. Yeah, I learned that through um, the musician for one of my podcasts, and also um, Eliza Rickman has posted a lot about that on oh, Facebook. So, yeah. yeah. Eliza Rickman, woo! Uh, oh, Eliza Rickman. She is not yeah. only a fantastic musician, but also just a delight of a human being. It's always yes. a great two-for-one. <laughs> um, yeah, she's great. She is. Uh, but yeah, so I'll post that. And where can our listeners find you on social media? Oh, I, on Twitter, I am at Kevin R. Free. On Instagram, I am also at Kevin R. Free. Um, <laughs> at Facebook, where you won't often find me, uh, I am at official Kevin R. Free. And I'm also Kevin R. Free on Snapchat, but I don't do a lot over there either because I am middle-aged. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, but, uh, Twitter, you can find me, you can find me on Twitter a lot on the internet. I'm at kevinrfree.com. Uh, the website needs an update, but I'm going to do that soon with links to all of the things that I'm doing right now. Um, yeah, that's it. That's everything I think. And this is where I would normally plug our Patreon, but I'm actually going to suggest instead of checking out ours, go check out the uh, New York Neo Futurists. Uh, I will go put that in the description because, you know, while I am making a little money right now, they aren't making money through the feed. So I am going to plug them instead. Uh, I have seen some of their work online and I've enjoyed everything I have seen. So That's great. That's I. Great. I mean, I am here to try and help others, so it, it feels like really weird to pr to plug all mine after you've done all this stuff, you know. <laughs> so uh, and yeah, go check out the reparations show. Uh, we the the queer the experience is every other Friday. I will bring on different voice actors, different entertainers, writers, whoever, uh, to to show, share their stories. And this has been Casper Oliver, joined by the fantastic Kevin R. Free, signing off. Thank you so much for listening. And remember, all the world's a stage, so give them one hell of a show. Until next time, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
Have you ever wondered what wanders the fields at night? Or have you seen lights out in the woods that you know are not lightning bugs or deer with just a few too many eyes? Well, all of these things are commonplace within the farm town of Wichton. Jar of Rebuke is a Midwestern gothic horror comedy audio drama run by a queer heavy cast and crew. Delve into the cornfields, explore the woods by the river, and make sure you bring your favorite dish to the local potluck because Wichton is full of many fine folks for you to meet, creatures for you to encounter, and many mysteries for you to solve. The creatures and hauntings within Jar of Rebuke are all based on real lore and legends from the Midwestern United States, from the black-eyed children to the not-deer to the Michigan melon heads. Follow Dr. Jared Hell's audio journal and his run-ins with these various creatures while trying to remember his forgotten past. With the voices of myself, Casper Oliver, as well as Vanessa Rosengrant, Ashley Kraft, Cecil Fox, and guests like Jason LaRock, Misha Bakshi, and Conrad Mishuk, as well as many, many more, providing their talents to flesh out the world of Wichden, the townsfolk within, and even the supernatural creatures themselves. Compared by listeners to things like Welcome to Night Vale, SCPs, the Magnus Archives, and Tannis, if those things but with a Midwestern Gothic twist seem up your alley, be sure to tune in on every 7th and 21st on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you get your podcast fix for new episodes of Jar of Rebuke.